Okay, people are now joining. Good. Let me know when everybody in. How many are there? Well, I don't know. Right now, um, nine. It's just they're they're coming in one at a time. They should probably be, there should be around twenty five or so. I think total. Yeah. They can. Um, our guests, for, um, our attendees, can probably hear what we're saying right now. Okay. So, um, hello, guests. I'm going to introduce everybody in a moment. No. We have twelve so far. Bonnie's here. Hello, Selena. Hello, Bonnie. Oh, Marcus in the audience. Mm -hmm. Penny's in the audience. Penny's attending from Florida. Oh, hi, Penny. <laughs> All right, so we have 13 people, so people are drifting in. I'll wait another, should I wait another five minutes or four minutes or three minutes or? Wait another four or five minutes. Susan uh, or Lisa, is the chat um, disabled? Yeah, it should only be the Q and A that's open. Okay. Okay, we got 17 people so far. For those who can hear me, um, we're just waiting a couple more minutes for a few more attendees to come in and um, then we'll start. Beautiful, we have 19, they're trickling in. Just going to, um, okay. All right. Should I wait one more minute? I think that we're about two or three people short of their full list. I think some people will arrive a little late. So maybe I'll begin. It's great to be here with you tonight and all of our listeners. Um, as the founder, one of the founders of Sharp Again Naturally and the moderator for tonight's panel, I'm going to give you a brief overview of Sharp Again and the work we do, and then turn it over to our panelists. So Sharp Again Naturally is a nonprofit that educates the public and the medical community about preventing and reversing dementia. We empower everyone to take charge of their cognitive health and general well-being. We support lifestyle changes and other steps that can improve cognition and memory. And we partner with professionals and organizations to broaden our reach and deepen our understanding of memory loss and its causes. So soon we'll be offering programs that put this education into action, which we'll tell you about a little bit later toward the end of the presentation. 
Um, so Sharp began naturally last spoke at the Katona study group about five years ago. And since then, there's, there have been some big changes in the world of cognitive health. So tonight, we'll bring you up to date on a few of the causes of memory loss that are particularly relevant uh, in these days of coronavirus. And specifically, we'll be speaking about airway and dental issues, the gut microbiome and nutrition, and toxins, um, you know, all of which really affect not only the brain, but also our immune systems. Uh, in the last five years, Sharp Again's emphasis has shifted somewhat, uh, and now we focus as much on preventing memory loss as on how to improve it. And we've also changed the scope of some of our causes and are tracking potential new ones, which we've, we've done since our inception. So here is our current list. Um, the first, as you'll see, nutritional imbalances and deficiencies, and Nancy will be talking more about that later. Toxins in our food, water, air, and work and home environments. Effects and interactions of prescription and other medications. Heavy metal toxicity, such as from mercury, lead, and other um, metals, maybe such as arsenic. Um, Hormonal imbalances, including thyroid, estrogen, testosterone, uh, cortisol. Low level infections. These are from things like Lyme disease or mold exposure, food sensitivities and oral infections. Not enough exercise, brain stimulation and social interaction. And that's a big one right now for all of us. Um, Prolonged and unremitting stress. Again, especially our frontline workers right now are, are feeling that. Um, sleep and breathing problems such as asthma, sleep apnea, and a narrowed airway. And physical and emotional trauma, including traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and other trauma that may begin in childhood. Uh, could be other forms of abuse. So in addition, there are other conditions that have a strong correlation with memory loss and with further research, they may be considered causes. Um, you know, one of these is hearing loss and another is depression. And a third factor is general anesthesia, um, which for people of age 70 and older has been problematic, especially with multiple exposures. Um, and, and especially if those are close together, let's say more than one operation within a six or a nine month period. So many people never fully recover their lucidity, total lucidity. So we're watching these and other cofactors and we'll update our list as more research becomes available. But what is clear is that one third of people in the US who live to be age 85 have Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. And many people are being diagnosed at younger ages. So Sharp Again's goal is to let everyone know what they can do starting today to lower the likelihood of joining the 5.8 million here in the US who live with the disease. So our three panelists will present information to do just that. So Dr. Howie Hinden, is trained in all aspects of general dentistry with an emphasis on craniofacial pain and sleep and dental sleep dental medicine, an acknowledged pioneer on the relationship between dental issues and whole body health. He was one of the first dentists to eliminate the use of mercury from his practice. Dr. Hinden is the co-founder and president of the Academy of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry, that's the AAPMD, and the Foundation for Airway Health organizations created to prevent the proliferation of chronic disease by raising awareness about airway, sleep, and breathing issues and offering training and education. Dr. Hinden is on both Sharp Again's main board as well as its medical and dental advisory board and practices in Suffer, New York. Nancy Weiser is a board certified health and wellness coach 
and a vice chair of Sharpie and Naturally. Her holistic approach combines practical, life-changing nutritional practices with guidance and support relating to exercise, stress management, and lifestyle. Nancy presents to medical, corporate, and lay groups and has been featured in various print and digital media, including the New York Times, Martha Stewart Living Radio, and the documentary Bought. She sees clients in Mamaroneck, New York, and virtually as well. Dr. Madeline Castellanos is a functional medicine physician with a specialty in psychiatry and has been in practice for over 20 years. Dr. Castellanos is a certified physician with the Institute for Functional Medicine, as well as certified in the Bredesen Protocol to reverse cognitive decline. She places great emphasis on nutrition, lifestyle, and state of mind, and helps patients understand the connection and synergy of all of these factors. She currently has practices in New York City and South Florida. So just for a little housekeeping, um, each of our panelists will present for about 20 minutes, and we ask that you hold questions in the Q until the Q&A at the end. So if you want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box, which will be at the bottom of your screen, and let us know if it is for a particular panelist. Um, we will get to as many of your questions as possible. And just know that everyone except our panelists will be muted during the presentation. So let's get started. I'll turn it over to Dr. Hinden. Hey, um, can you hear me, Lisa? Yes. Um, I'm going to put my presentation up, share a screen. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and let me just find it. It's not it. One second. <clears throat> anyway, I'll start talking while I look for it. I am uh, Dr. Howard Hinden. I am a a uh, dentist with in practice for over twenty three years. A little bit of a rebel. I was one of the first dentists to eliminate fluoride from my practice. And uh, I'm one of the first dentists to stop using mercury in my practice. Uh, let me see. It is not where I have to be. Howie? Yeah? Would you, would you, you want Nancy to go now and since she's probably no, I, ready? I, no, I, let me, let me just give me one second. Sure. To find it. I got it. I didn't recognize it because I had the shop again sign right up there. <laughs> so are we seeing my screen now? Yes. Um, play. All right. We're good? We're good. Okay. So uh, when I first heard about the opportunity to be part of this Katona study group meeting. And I remember being there a number of years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, with a uh, room packed with people, standing room only, all interested in, the, in this, this topic and how have things changed. And my role was supposed to be give you the role of the dentist in the uh, treating the reversible causes of, of dementia, Alzheimer's and cognitive loss. <clears throat> but the world has changed and we're in this world of, uh, of COVID and coronavirus and everything that we knew before is, is different. When I was a kid growing up, uh, my mother told me stories about one of her sisters who died as a result of the Spanish flu of uh, 1918. And the lesson that she learned was you can't trust the medical establishment of doctors because if you got sick and and needed a doctor, you were taking your chances whether you would live or die. 
well, that was in 1918, and now we're 100 and a little, a little bit more than 100 years later. And uh, maybe things have changed. Maybe they haven't, because our, we have made, made great strides in, in what our medical establishment can do. Uh, great advancements in, uh, in, in drugs and, and acute diseases. <clears throat> but this uh, pandemic has taught us a number of things. One of the things is that our medical system is disjointed. We practice in silos and different practitioners don't talk to each other. The pharmaceutical industries and the hospitals and the medical organizations uh, aren't really in connection with one another. And uh, that has to change because that's one of the failures. The other thing is we haven't stockpiled our resources. We don't have enough ventilators, we don't have enough masks, we don't have other things that we need. And so what I think about is they'll solve that problem. Hopefully what we have to solve is how do we deal with our internal stockpiles? How do we make sure our immune system can deal better with what's coming on? And so I have this little picture of, of uh, the plains on Africa and uh, the wildebeest herd and the lion stalks the herd and looks to find the weak link, the wildebeest that's lurking and falling behind the pack. And that's the one they're gonna, they're gonna pick off. And I think this is very, an example of what is happening with the pandemic. Who gets sick, who suffers? Those who are older, those with uh, comorbidities, chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and things like that. And uh, how does this relate to where we are today with, uh, and, and show up again naturally? When you think about it, all of the, all of the things that we're talking about are, uh, oh, excuse me, that's my slide. These are the symptoms of, uh, of coronavirus that, that have been uh, mentioned. Loss of taste and smell, balance, problems with balance fatigue, confusion, um, ataxia, and coma. And I was just reading uh, a couple of hours ago, they're finding a new symptom that a lot of people are really dying because of blood clots, hypercoagula hypercoagulation of the blood. The blood gets thicker and there are blood clots all over the body, not just in, uh, not just in the lungs. And there was a Broadway actor who just ended up having to have his leg amputated because of blood clots in, in his leg. And uh, the way the virus affects us are, are two, twofold. One is by the direct viral load that is, is, uh, accumulates. And the other, interestingly, and maybe more important, is uh, the cytokine storm. What is the cytokine storm? We have this wonderful, incredible immune system that was created to, to protect us and ensure our survival. Our immune system consists of two parts. Our innate immune system, which immediately kills anything that comes into contact with us. And there's the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is one that learns what the enemy is and, and then mounts a response. The adaptive immune system consists of many different particles. There are different lymphocytes and interleukins and, and uh, macrophages. But what we should know, there are things that, that we call um, identifier cells. They are like these cells that the equivalent would be when a, a company is going to cut down trees in a forest, somebody goes by and puts a big red X on the trees that need to be cut down so that when the uh, rest of the lumber team comes along, they will know which trees they're, they're going to uh, remove. And it's a wonderful system as long as our immune system identifies what has to be removed and what doesn't have to be removed. But in some cases, our immune system doesn't function properly. It either doesn't identify the, the, the right cells, the right agents that need to be attacked, or in some cases, it actually overreacts. It begins to attack things that don't need to be attacked. It begins to attack our own cells. And uh, they're finding out that many, many people who die from the coronavirus 
actually die not from the virus itself, but from our immune system's reaction to the virus, overreacts, kills our own cells, the cells build up and they actually block the, our lungs ability to bring oxygen into the rest, into the rest of the body. So we have to connect the dots. And how does that, that relate to why we're here tonight at this, this meeting? Lisa mentioned the causes of that Stropping naturally has about why, uh, what we have to look out for, for uh, dementia, Alzheimer's and cognitive uh, loss. But you can't think of them as individual because it's, it's really a system. It's like thinking of your a car that's not working and thinking of, well, it's a transmission and the tires, uh, the brakes. But you, ha you can't just deal with any one factor. You have to deal with them all. And what happens in the immune system that begins to create a problem, even when we're, we're children, uh, there was an, another article today that showed air pollution is, uh, increases the risk of, uh, of dementia. That was in, uh, I think it was in Sweden, a, a group they're measuring uh, following a co cohort study for many, many years. And exposure to pollution, especially in people who have comorbidities with um, of cardiovascular disease, greatly increases the risk uh, of dementia. Another article just today showed that people with vision problem increases their risk of, of dementia. So uh, you have to think of it in terms of all the things put, put together. From a dental perspective, we can deal with a couple of, of the issues. And the, and the four I'm going to briefly talk about in the time that I have left are periodontal disease, TMJ problems, airway, and infections. So first periodontal uh, problems. Why is that important? The bacteria that cause periodontal disease has been found to be the same bacteria that you find in the brains of people with Alzheimer's, uh, B. gingivalis. It's also the same bacteria that you find in atherosclerotic plaques of cardiovascular disease. And in my opinion, Alzheimer's and, um, and uh, cognitive loss and dementia are just a continuum of chronic diseases that are all related to an inflammatory, uncontrolled inflammatory process and an overreaction of our, our immune system. So anything that starts even in childhood or adulthood uh, will just follow that, that path. People don't get Alzheimer's and they've never had anything before. They don't have, it's not like I've never had a problem. They usually have a history of at least one or more of the chronic inflammatory diseases. So Having a periodontal problem and periodontal disease is the number one inflammatory disease in the entire world by far. Uh, having gums that are unhealthy, that bleed, that have pockets and allows that, that bacteria, the, the uh, pathogens that, are, that can cause uh, cardiovascular and, uh, and can get to the brain and build up over a period of time. And it may not even be the bacteria per se, just as I mentioned in, in terms of the coronavirus, it's the body's response to it. The bacteria get into, the, into our system and then we have an overreactive immune response and that inflammatory response over many, many years and in, in, in decades can lead to uh, dementia and cognitive loss. So it's not a question of waiting till you have a problem. If you have a periodontal problem, it's not something that should be overlooked because it's not just having a healthy mouth. It, it's related to the health of your, of your heart, related to diabetes, and it's certainly related to the health of your brain. TMJ problem. Uh, TMJ MJ problem is thought of as pain in your, do in your, in your joint, jaw joints, uh, bruxine, bruxism, clenching your teeth, maybe even headaches and, and neck aches. But that imbalance, that stress, that 24-7 stress of not having a good bite, the way we chew 24-7 uh, changes our immune system, puts us into an upregulated sympathetic mode. We're more adrenaline. 
we, we, we're in a fight or flight mode. And when you're in that mode, your immune system uh, ramps up to protect us from whatever may come along. And it never comes down from this place of high alert. And that, and that not having the ability to rest, not having a chance to recover, it create a, it can create a problem also. Um, let's move on to airway. So it's, so our practice is becoming more involved in airway and sleep and, um, how we breathe and how we sleep is one of the major factors related to health. Uh, people with airway problems are much more prone to having serious, uh, complications from the coronavirus. One of the interesting things, we ran a, a webinar yesterday on nasal, nasal breathing. And one of our presenters was Peter Catalano, who is a uh, ENT physician from Boston. And um, he treats children as, as young as uh, three years old, where if they have a poor nasal breathing, they go, he goes in with a uh, laser and just removes some of the tissue and some of the bone and creates a better airway space for children. And, the, and he's been doing this for a number of years. And in the last five years, anecdotally, he noticed five children who had um, autism who reversed their autism by the treatment he was getting. He wasn't treating them. He wasn't looking for it. It, it, it just was a byproduct. It was a combination of, of uh, increasing the nasal airway and maybe some orthodontic treatment to expand the airway. And we were talking on the webinar, like, all right, this is anecdotal. Maybe this is just coincidence. What could be the rationale for that? And the rationale seems to be that in children, during the night, they process all the new information that they're learning. And if they're not sleeping well because of poor breathing, they are not processing the inf information right. They're not connecting the different parts of, of their brain together for function. Well, if this uh, theory is, is true, what does it tell us when we get older? If we're not sleeping well and we're not having that period of time when our brains clean out from uh, all the toxins at night and, and uh, they know there's a mechanism where we, our brain cleans itself out at night and it only happens when we sleep well and we go through all the, all the different stages of breathing, which I'm not going to go into now, that only happens when we, when we, breathe, when we breathe properly. And uh, so sleep and breathing is absolutely essential. Even if you do everything right with nutrition and all the other factors, and if, if you're not sleeping well and you're not breathing right, then as, um, as Dale Bredesen said, you're not dealing with all the holes in the roof. And, and if there's one takeaway message I want you to, to understand is you have to deal with not just one or two, you have to deal with all of, of the issues that are involved. And the last thing I want to mention from the dental arena is infections. Very often you can have a dental infection in your mouth that has no symptoms. Uh, a root canal that is sort of not right, uh, a tooth that is, uh, uh, has a, an abscess, it can be chronic. You may notice it, you may notice it from time to time, but that infection is an infection that your immune system is fighting to hold at bay. It, it controls the symptoms, but the infection still is leaking into your body and your immune system is saying, I have to send out my soldiers in order to mount a, an attack against that. And I have to do it on a constant basis. And when that happens, our immune systems get ramped up, they function at a higher level. And now you have an immune system that is now on high alert all of the time. That immune system is then going to be over responsive. And then when something else comes along like coronavirus or any other disease, it's going to overreact, overreact. And when it re overreacts, one of the uh, mechanisms by which it heals is the production of inflammation. And, and then we, we move into a state of chronic inflammation, the result being that uh, we now are more uh, exposed to all 
of the chronic problems that chronic inflammation can, uh, can bring. The, the uh, heart problems, diabetes, uh, osteoporosis, cancer, and uh, Alzheimer's and uh, the loss of cognitive function. So in a short period of time, I have tried to give you a bit of an overview of, uh, of what I believe in. And, and my belief is that you have to know all of the symptoms and connect the dots because there are so many things in our life, our lifestyle and everything around us that's leading to, that's contributing to, to this problem. And, I, and my message of hope is there is the, the hope that when the coronavirus and COVID passes, and I know it will, that we will have a new health, new and a better healthcare system where we will realize that our medical system is not going to solve all our problems. We have to take charge of our health. And the mere fact that all of you are on this uh, study group tonight, you are the ones who not only are interested in taking charge of your own health, but you are the messengers that will take our message out to uh, back to your family, to your uh, friends, and to your community. And with the knowledge that we're sharing with you tonight, you will be the leaders of a better healthcare system that will come in the future. So I, I thank you for listening, and uh, I look forward to hearing your questions after all the other presentations. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Howie. Um, and you know, I think you made such a good point about, I mean, you even touched on several different types of things, including sleep and airway issues and periodontal disease and, and, and oral infections. And what we'll see throughout the entire presentation is that everything really is connected. Um, and every topic we're gonna to talk about tonight, um, we can't go through all the causes because it would take way too long, but you'll see even they seem so unrelated, they're all related in the body. And um, I, th I think our goal is to just give, give people a, a taste of, of what they, where they can go next. And there's just such a wealth of information on the website and, and that's growing all the time. Right, right. All right, so next um, I'd like to introduce uh, Nancy Weiser, who is gonna talk about uh, nutrition and the gut microbiome. So Nancy. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Howie, that was so informative. And it really dovetails really exactly with what I'm gonna talk about. So Lisa, I think you knew that going into this when you planned it so beautifully. <laughs> um, so what you're going to hear about today, I'm gonna launch right in because I have just a few things to talk about. First is the gut-brain connection. And I'm gonna talk about the gut-brain connection and what that means for both inflammation and for overall immunity, which we've just really had a beautiful introduction to. And it's funny, I don't know if you planned this either, but we started with the mouth. I'm gonna work a little bit down from there into the gut. So it's all gonna literally flow and follow. I'm gonna talk about the gut microbiome. That's your body's internal rainforest. And I'll talk more about what that means. It's the internal world of bacteria. It controls everything from our digestion to our mood. I'll talk about a diet for a healthy gut and immune system. Um, I'll look, we'll look at some pictures and talk about some food and what you can do right now, including the food, um, so that you can really, well, I was gonna say you can go home and put some of these things into practice, but I think everybody is home. So you can walk to your kitchen and put some of these things into practice. Okay, so the first thing here that um, I think is interesting to understand is this gut-brain connection. And that overall, um, the, what we're talking about here is something that really involves neurology. And that, under, that understanding is if you go to the neurologist, it's all about the brain, but it also involves immunology, pathology, which I think Howie also touched on, and endocrinology, which is the whole notion of our hormones and how this is all connected. So I'm sure everybody here has at some point or various points in their lives um, experienced the feeling of butterflies in their stomach or been sick with grief or anxiety. This is your gut brain at work, and it is bi-directional. It goes from your brain to your gut, but it also goes from your gut to your brain. So what actually is that mechanism that is sending the signal that allows your body to react that way? And the connector, the connector 
the connector guy here is the vagus nerve, the thing that you see over here on the left of the screen. This is both the connector and the communicator of this two-way street, of this communication avenue. And it is the, really the longest of the 12 cranial nerves, the nerves that come out of your brain. And it actually goes from the brain stem right down into the abdomen. You may have seen pictures of this. It's like a little ball would be your head, with a little cord coming out and would go right down into your stomach. So the big news I find here is that the population that we, that of, of bacteria that resides and lives in our gut, the number, the ratio of what we call the good to the bad or the less good, the diversity and the quality affects the cells all along the vagus nerve. So they're not just in our gut, because remember the vagus nerve goes right up into my brain and how they function. So this is how the brain and gut really literally are connected and how they communicate with each other. I kind of like this drawing, it's a little crude, but it gives you that idea. Here's my brain, here's my gut. So two nervous systems, what really is the vagus nerve looking to connect? And there are actually two nervous systems. The central nervous system, which is the thing you're probably the most familiar with, that includes the brain and the spinal cord. And then something that we refer to as the gut brain, or the enteric nervous system. And this controls really so much of our biology. It includes our, our hormones, our muscles, and our immune system. It controls like 80 to 90% of the production of serotonin, which you probably know is the feel-good hormone. Um, and so they call the enteric nervous system the second nervous system and the second brain, and I think actually maybe it's the first brain, I don't know. So these two nervous systems actually formed also, it says right on here, and they formed at the same time in the developing fetus, which means, I don't know, by nature, they're kind of equal. They're not really two separate with one being better than the other. I kind of think that the one that's in our gut is the more intuitive sort of the truth, if you will. Down in the lower right-hand corner, this introduces the concept, whereas Howie did introduce it, picks up on that about inflammation and what are called free radicals. So when we experience any kind of stress, um, and it's important to understand that our brains have this limbic system, which is our ancient brain, it's millions of years old, and it can't differentiate between when I'm being chased by a bear, or a lion, or a tiger, and when I've had a fight with my spouse or had a run-in with my boss at work, it's all the same to my body. It's not that sophisticated that it knows which is which. So because of the, the gut-brain connection, whether it's physical or mental stress, it will all be perceived in the same way. And what will happen is the body launches this inflammatory response. How we talked about cytokines or cytokines, I don't know which it is, and sends the system into really a high alert situation. So it can be stress from food or toxins, and those will push the body to have this kind of hyperimmune response. Not so much of a low level response, it's more of an acute response. Inflammation over time leads to the formation of free radicals. That's when a little piece of the cell breaks off and kind of goes rogue in your system and probably does some things that we don't want it to do, including ca causing the brain to go, in a, go into a kind of rusty situation. So it kind of is less, literally less pliable and uh, doesn't function as well. Okay. Here's one of my favorites. So I'm going to refer a lot of times within the course of the next few slides to the gut wall. So I know you all know what a wall is, but I really need us to kind of, um, in a metaphorical way, be able to refer to a wall versus a picket fence, right? So this represents the one on the left, one that's not so healthy. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And the one on the right is the one that is the more highly functioning, healthy part of our immune system or our gut wall. So this is the border between the outside world, the outside of what's around you, and the inside world. And this is our most intimate relationship that we share with things from the outside world when we take something from the outside and we stick it inside our body from the mouth, okay? So the border between the inside and the outside of you is protecting your organs, your tissues, your cell, including your cells and including your brain. And you don't want anything leaking through it because that can compromise everything that's on the other side of that. Other side of the wall, if you will, to look at the wall now, is the immune system. So you have, a, this is the gut, here's the food coming down, you have the wall, and immediately on the other side of the wall, you have the immune system. So if you don't have a wall and you have a picket fence and something slides through, well, guess what's right on the other side is the immune system that's now ready to sound the alert to the rest of the body 
as if something toxic is on its way in there that it wants to fight. Okay, so a healthy gut equals a healthy immune system. And you know, Howie, we could even say that the gut starts up in the mouth because it does. It starts here and it goes all the way through your system until it goes out the bottom, as we all know. So on the other side of the wall is the immune system ready to sound the alert. And between 70% and they say 80% of your immune system actually resides inside your microbiome. And I think it's helpful here to envision Remember that biosphere project they did out in Arizona, like, I don't know, 20 years ago? And it's literally like a dome with people living inside it and all kinds of vegetation and life. So it is like this kind of dome or biome with all kinds of micro stuff growing inside there. Ideally, it will be a population of very healthy bacteria that are going to help to keep you healthy. Um, in fact, we have more of these kind of bacteria in us than we do human cells. So a little bit more on that. Um, Toxins, you see over here, first level of defense against toxins. Toxins can come from food. Again, we talked about those going down when you swallow them. Toxins in the environment or perceived or real stress, like I talked about with the bear versus this, the fight with the spouse. Same thing, all lead to gut inflammation because the body doesn't know the difference. A little bit more on how this, is, how this happens, just to get a little bit deeper into like, you know, some of the terminology and some of the functionality of what's happening with the gut wall. So the gut surface is a surface of epithelial tissue. This makes sense. It goes along with what Howie said. It starts in the mouth. So the epithelial tissue in our body is in our mouth, it's in our nose, it's in our eyes, and it's also throughout the entire intestinal wall. Um, it absorbs nutrients that pass through it. So we're talking about a brick wall, but it's a little bit porous, enough for, so that the nutrients can get through. Secondly, it's a barrier to harmful pathogens and toxins, blocking them from getting through the wall. And then thirdly, the wall contains, the, mic the, microbes, in the microbes in the wall contain what are called immunoglobulins. Yes, I had to practice how to say that. Immunoglobulins, it has the word immune in it. These are chemical antibodies that actually bind to bacteria and any other kind of foreign particle that's coming down the, coming down the tract, coming down the intestine. And it prevents them from attaching to the gut wall and then sneaking in behind the immune system and causing real issues. So they come from the immune system cells through the gut wall into the intestine so that these harmful bugs can then be excreted out of the body with your digestion. So basically I called it a wall, but I just wanted to be clearer that there's things moving into the body from the wall that you want, nutrients. There's things moving from the other side of the wall, these immunoglobulins from the immune system, into the intestine to be able to have the bad guys not attached to the wall and then carry them out of the body the way they're supposed to be so they don't cause disease for you. Another thing I wanna to do tonight is I wanna get a little bit more of a visceral feeling here and have you guys participate as much as possible even though we're not together in person. So we're gonna do this little finger exercise that I designed just today for you all. So we're gonna take your two fingers, your index finger and your middle finger on both hands and make a tic-tac-toe board or a cootie shot. I didn't think of that till just now, okay? So it's a tic-tac-toe board. And what you wanna do is open and close it. Open it and close it. So close it really tight and try to look through it. Good job, Madeline, I love the participation. She's the only one I can see. So you look through it, you see you can't look through it. I mean, I can sort of see a little something through it, but you know, for the most part, I can't see it. That's what you want. You want a tight junction of these epithelial cells that line the gut wall. Now open it a little bit. So when I open it a little bit, that's what happens. When I have a real tic-tac-toe board, I can see Madeline, I can see Lisa, I can see you all, even though I can't, I can't really. And um, things like sugar and gluten weaken the intestinal walls, allowing this now to become an open tic-tac-toe board or a picket fence. Those are things that, that, that break the, the nutrient, the, the body isn't able to sufficiently break down the nutrients and allows the wrong bacteria now to really get into our system, so we don't want that. The junctions determine our body's inflammation level. So depending upon how open those junctions are, how those epithelial cells talk to one another and talk through one another, that really determines our information level and how equipped we are to deal with any kind of disease or you know, bad situation that comes our way. So open junctions, increased inflammation, more susceptibility to disease, closed up tight, our immune system is working well. Autoimmunes, when we have these open junctions, is when the body can start to theoretically attack itself. And we get autoimmunes, including celiac, allergies, 
HIV, IBD, you know, diabetes, autism, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's, kind of like the whole soup to nuts deal on things that you don't want going on that are chronic, and some are potentially, you know, really dangerous and certainly unpleasant for you and your loved ones. And here I'm just going to say a little bit about gluten, because I get often, as a health coach, I'm often asked the question by clients and people who are not clients, hey, you know, um, if I'm not gluten sensitive or I'm not celiac, do I really have to worry about gluten? And the way I, first of all, the answer is yes. So let's just make that simple. And I'm getting a big nod from Madeline. I love the participation from just the few people I can see. So gluten, just so you know, is a sticky substance. And the way I thought about this earlier was like, okay, gluten is what is sticky enough to hold a piece of bread together. A piece of bread is made out of flour and maybe some grains, maybe if you're lucky. Why doesn't it all fall apart? Why does it hold together? That's what gluten's job is. It's a sticky substance that is part of wheat, also rye and barley. But the stickiness, when it goes into my gut, it interferes with the breakdown of nutrients that lead to really an assault on the intestinal lining. And then an alarm, of course, goes off telling the immune system, hey, you better start to send out some inflammation to protect my body overall, inside and outside my gut. So what happens over time is if you keep doing this, of course you can get away with it once or twice or occasionally. If you keep doing it, you may develop more and more food sensitivities. And that's, that's really a problem because that's when you have the wrong kind of microbes getting past the junctions. When you have the junctions are opening up and you have, then you'll get more and more food sensitivities, hard to even discern which things you're actually sensitive to. Um, I've seen this in my own situation when I know people who have dementia and they have so many food sensitivities, you really can't even figure it out. This is true for everybody, not just people who are celiac or have a, a diagnosed gluten sensitivity. Gliadin is the protein in the gluten. It's called gliadin. It's a water soluble protein. And it, it makes, it is all human being, all human guts are sensitive to this gliadin protein and it in increases the gut permeability in everybody. If you wanna read more on this, uh, one of my favorite books on the topic is called Brain Maker by David Perlmutter. And he uses a lot of examples from the work of Dr. Alessio Fasano from Harvard. And they talk a lot, he talks a lot about the gluten. Okay, here we go, another fun slide. Um, the gut inflammation leads to brain inflammation. So leaky gut, just think about the junctures and the junctions and the tic-tac-toe board you just made or the, or the picket fence. Toxins, unbalanced gut flora. Again, the wrong kind, the wrong ratio of certain kinds to others. I won't go into the names of those. Not a diverse enough population. Now, so you might have just too much of the same thing because certain ones have been killed off by factors I'll talk about in a minute. And not the right number. Cause inflammation in the body, including the brain, and that gets an exclamation point because a lot of people, including doctors who are treating things as Howie says in, in um, silos, don't consider these things that are, these things are one thing. That's why I went to such elaborate pains to explain the vagus nerve and the connection that it's all one. And gut bacteria can either extinguish the inflammation, keeping it under control, or it can fan the flames if you have the wrong kind. So that tells a little bit of the story. Okay, now the fun begins. Um, this is, you know, this is nine slides in one. I love this because I think this is a fairly complete list, at least by, in terms of what we now know, about what disrupts the healthy microbiome. So, you know, this is really like, you know, everything but the kitchen sink. Um, and you'll see here that there are some, you know, don't get mad at me, that there are certain things that you have no control over. Like if you were born by C-section, if you were formula fed, and if you've got a lot of antibiotics, usually for things like repeated ear infections, strep, or acne, um, you know, and you're past that now, oh, I'm, you know, I'm doomed. Not true. There's a lot of things on here that you have a lot of control over. But I will say, if any of those things describes you, let's be a little bit more vigilant about controlling and dealing with some of the other things and being conscious of building my brick wall versus my picket fence. Okay, so those, you got those three going on that are like, eh, can't do anything about that. Ongoing antibiotics, you can 
you know, choose to work with your doctor to see if there are ways around that. Of course, if you need them, go on them, um, you know, because they can save your life also. Uh, NSAIDs, that is an abbreviation for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Non-steroidal, meaning non-steroid. So Advil and ibuprofen, you know, a lot of us, a lot of people I know, they will pop an Advil at like, oh my God, my fingernail, bro. you know, I mean, anything, they'll go popping an Advil. Can you take a bath or do a stretch because you, you pulled a muscle? You know, can you just rest one day, put your feet up and watch television before you take an Advil to run out? Um, there's lots of ways around that. Environmental toxins, I know this is what, more what Madeline is gonna be discussing, but I like to just break this down very simply into three different areas that you can affect. One is what I've been talking about. You ingest toxins. If you are eating foods that are not organic, that are conventional, that are processed, made with many ingredients, come in a bag or a box, usually contain gluten or sugar, you ingest environmental toxins. You inhale environmental toxins when you are cleaning your house with all the things we're supposed to be cleaning our house with night right now, Clorox, Lysol, et cetera, um, you know, hand, hand sanitizers, um, specifically made with things like triclosan and uh, alcohol. These things are things that you, you know, both absorb and inhale. Things like cooking with nonstick pans. Nonstick pan will not hurt you unless you heat it up. So if you just want to have your nonstick pan in your kitchen and you don't heat it up, that's too, super fine. But as soon as you cook with it, it emits all kinds of fumes that are toxic. Sugar in all its forms. Let's be kind of clear here because there's, you know, I know we can all sneak around and like make bargains with ourselves. This is everything from pasta to alcohol. Yes, alcohol is another name for sugar. Um, sugar is problematic. And, you know, I told Lisa when we were putting this together, this could be, its, this little piece of this slide could be its whole own presentation for two hours, um, which I actually, I do that. I do a presentation for two hours on just that. But suffice it to say that if, if one is diabetic, your chance of getting Alzheimer's disease is twice that of somebody who's not diabetic. Um, and the way this very simply works is, this is another little hand illustration, is that you have your hand, is the insulin, it's a hormone, and it's a ferry system or a train. The glucose is what your food breaks down into that your ferry system or insulin wants to put, carry this into my cell where it will be used as energy. Here's my cell, open up your hand, make a little lock and key. So here's the insulin, it's taken the, into, my, into my cell to be used as energy. But if this is all clogged up with bad fat, plus I eat too much sugar, the insulin cannot get its, it cannot do it, can't do the job. It's like trying to put a car key, if you remember car keys, car key into the car, the ignition of your car, but there's gum in there. You can't get it in, it's not gonna do the job. So this sugar is gonna just pile up in my bloodstream, causing inflammation, including in my brain, leading to dementia, which is why, you know, uh, sugar, I mean, sorry, sugar. Alzheimer's is now being referred to as type three diabetes. Yes, thank you. Okay, so what is your risk? Here we're gonna talk about a diet, ways to limit your risk. Um, I love this picture because it's colorful um, and it has all kinds of fun things you can eat. And I'm gonna tell you why these are good in the next slide, but let's just look at this together. We have dandelion greens on the upper left, jicama on the upper right. Those are prebiotic foods. You might not know what those are, I'll tell you in a second. Kimchi in the lower left-hand corner, that is a probiotic food, a fermented food. It's essentially fermented cabbage kind of a, um, you know, a, a first cousin of um, sauerkraut. And then you've got some fish for their really good omega-3s. Most of the fat in your brain is omega-3 fats. Processed foods are mostly made from omega-6s. We need to balance that out with more omega-3s. Talk more about that in a minute. So here we go. Prebiotics like the dandelion greens and the jicama I just showed you, asparagus and garlic and onions, Think about this, what I always say to people is, this is, this is the flower food. So if you've been lucky enough to ever have anyone bring you flowers, it comes with a packet of, of food. That's what this is. It's food for the plants. So if you think about the microbiome as this lovely rainforest, this environment that's filled with these positive microbes doing all this microbes doing wonderful things for you, then this is what you need to keep those trees looking alive and healthy and prosperous versus wilted or dead or not even there. So that's what they do. They're like plant food. Probiotics are just upping the quantity of the good microbes in your, in your intestine. So these act very much like what you hope is in there and you're, you're feeding it more. So you can do a supplement or you can do foods like kimchi and sauerkraut, yogurt. 
I like a vegan yogurt myself, so I use a coconut yogurt, um, and other things that are fermented. Tempeh, it's a soy product, I don't love that, but because it's fermented, it's actually okay. So every, every little bit here and there, a little bit here and there is okay. Healthy fats, avocados, walnuts, the smash fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Sardines are especially great to keep around and great to do now in the hoarding season. I have a closet full of cans of sardines. So that's great. Um, all of these are both high in omega-3s, these smash fish. They're also low in neurotoxins. So again, how we touched on that metal, we'll talk about that, but that would be you know, mercury at the, probably the worst, PCBs and dioxins. These fish are great for you and they hopefully have very low levels of those things. Low in processed carbs. I just make this really simple. Avoid flour and sugar. No if, ands, or buts. It's so honest, honest, honestly, it is just so much easier if you just don't eat these things, not if you try to do it some of the time or try to do it in moderation. Just take, just take my word, I swear. It's just easier to just, just do it, not have those things. Gluten-free, yes, I explained a little bit about the gluten before, um, and you want that to be non-processed. So in other words, not your gluten-free bagels and cookies and bread that are made with tapioca, starch and potato starch, all those things also compromise the gut. They're not great for you. They don't build any healthy, uh, healthy gut flora. Okay, consider supplements. Um, love my list of supplements here. Just so you know, this is turmeric tea, live example. Turmeric, you see the picture on the bottom of the screen is this root that is a member of the ginger family. And it is both an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant, which is great. So you can do it in root form and I put it in my juices that I make, my smoothies. I use the, um, the powder, I had homemade chicken soup for lunch and in went the spice right out of the jar with some pepper, which activates the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties of turmeric or buy it in a pill. That's why it's on the supplement list. You can buy it on the pill. Vitamin D3, vitamin D3 is actually a hormone. If you live north of the line that runs from Los Angeles to Atlanta or Atlanta to Los Angeles, you are by definition most likely vitamin D3 deficient. So you need to take a supplement in the winter um, and have your levels checked by your doctor. I put that in there because vitamin D toxicity would be for somebody who has too much di uh, vitamin, three, di vitamin D3. It doesn't come up often, but it could come up. Have your levels checked so you can adjust with your doctor how much you should be taking. Coconut oil, anti-inflammatory, great for the brain. Alpha-lupoic acid, antioxidant reduces inflammation. This is all about reducing inflammation, whether it's periodontal, it's in your brain, it's in your gut, it's all about the same thing. Probiotic, we had probiotic foods on the prior slide, fermented foods, yogurts, EPA, DHA, that is the, the, good, the good omega-3 fat um, that is most abundant in breast milk. That's one of the reasons it's so important to um, be breastfed, if you can be, if you are, but you can do it for your own children. Um, and, uh, and omega-3s are, the, are, the, brain, are the, brain, the brain fat that we all need, and that's what DHA supports. What you can do now. So this is a summary of pretty much everything we just talked about. And I would love to go through the whole thing and talk about it all over again, but I'm not. I'm gonna go really fast and just summarize. Daily, add prebiotic and probiotic foods to your diet. Remember the picture of the prebiotics and how they are like flower food, jicama, dandelion, etc. Probiotic foods, yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, maybe a little tempeh, fermented foods, a little bit. Healthy fats, avocados, walnuts, other kinds of nuts and seeds as well, and good kinds of fish. Um, make sure you're looking at the smash fish or the, or the really good ones that are low in toxins, high in omega-3s. Get a water filter, even the most basic, you know, Brita filter or something like that to eliminate chlorine, which kills good bacteria. We don't want that. When we kill the good bacteria, all the bad ones come up and it's a it's a bad scene. Supplements that I just talked about, pretty basic ones, nothing, nothing probably too esoteric. Reduce or eliminate processed foods, sugar, sugar in all its forms, that's all processed white powdered food and processed white rice and white pasta, all those things. Gluten, talked about that. Yes, it's for everybody. Yes, it will help everybody feel better and hopefully avoid Alzheimer's disease, hopefully. All sodas and GMO foods, what do those things do? They break down that gut wall. They turn it from the wall into the picket fence. They open the junctions that should be tight and they make them loose. You don't want those. And this AIDs like Advil and ibuprofen, extremely irritating to the gut. Some people even know that they get a stomach ache for those things. It's body, your body telling you something. Antibiotics, I say limit if possible. So of course, if you need them, you need them. 
But let's say you're the mom of a kid, you take them to the doctor, the doctor says ear infection, you can have a conversation with the doctor to say, hey, can we come back in 48 hours and have a little look and see if maybe it's getting better on its own and we can avoid the antibiotics this time? Have a conversation about that versus just going whole hog in for the antibiotics or even requesting them for something that you don't need them for. All, consider alternatives to birth control, chemicals and toxins in your home and personal care products. I know we're going to hear more about from that, that, more about that from Madeline. And there you have it. Whoops, I can't hear you guys. Thank you so much. That was very comprehensive and uh, a lot of food for thought. Huh? And um, again, showing how this is all related, you know, uh, yeah. you, you can, you could talk about the gut, you could talk about toxins. Um, I can't wait to hear more about that from, from Madeline. So why don't you take it away? Okay, great. So thank you so much for having me here today to speak to you guys. Um, you know, I, I'm a functional medicine physician and a functional medicine approach is a systems based approach to medicine. And that's why Howard and, and um, Nancy were saying that all this ties together because even though we're presenting these as separate topics, they are not separate at all. There is tremendous overlap and what affects one part of the system affects the rest of the system. And so as I present today about toxins, I'm talking about toxins and how they relate specifically to dementia. However, they can affect your system in many, many different ways. And so I want you to keep that in mind, even though I might be talking about it in a very circumscribed way. So first, uh, I want to give you some definitions and by no means do I wanna get super technical, but I do think it's important to talk a, a little bit about what these different things mean because you might hear these different terms. So something that's toxic, obviously, is something that's capable of causing injury or death, something that's considered poisonous to the system. And usually it's a dose dependent thing, but we will see that in our body, even small amounts can have big effects on our health. So a toxin is actually a natural substance that's produced by something that's living uh, on this earth, plant, animal, fungi, or bacteria, but it can have a toxic effect on our system. Now there's a different term for other, uh, other chemicals which called toxicants, which are types of poisons that are actually man-made introduced into the environment by all of the lovely processes and chemicals that, you know, and manufacturing that we do, and they can also have toxic effects. So I'm just gonna use the term toxin, but if you are in doing your research, find the word toxicant, that's what that means. It's just uh, man-made. A xenobiotic is a chemical that is foreign to the body, but it mimics a hormone or some other compound of the body and therefore can have an effect on the body. So it comes from the outside world, but it can mimic and in some cases be much more potent than some of the uh, substances that we have in our own body and therefore can dysregulate our system and be problematic. And then my favorite one is the POP the persistent organic pollutant, which Nancy alluded to, which substances that bioaccumulate and they persist in the environment. And as you have animals that uh, go up the food chain and then eat other animals, these substances can accumulate in that animal's system. Then the next larger animal eats that. And then you, they have their own persistent organic pollutants that then accumulate. And so it's almost like a concentrating effect. And this is one of the reasons why some of these smash fish, which are smaller, uh, don't have as many pollutants in them, just because by, by the, the fact that they're smaller, they haven't accumulated as many of them. So that's very important in choosing some foods for yourself. So how do toxins get into our body? Well, there's the three classic ways, right? First is we can inhale them through what we breathe. Now, everybody knows uh, if you're standing behind uh, a city bus, right? And it like lets out this big uh, cloud of diesel fumes, you're breathing in a, a bunch of air pollution. However, we're all breathing in air pollution to some extent on a daily basis. And um, what Howard said is very important. It's a major cause of dementia. It's also a major cause of lung illness and other issues because just that pollution that we take in through our lungs gets into our circulation, into our body, and can be another cause of that leaky gut, that 
overly permeable intestinal membrane that Nancy spoke about. Other things that we breathe in can be volatile organic compounds like solvents, formaldehyde, toluene, you know, nail salons are terrible. Uh, if you're, you know, at a hair salon, there's hairspray and the toxins that come from dyes and things as such. And mold toxins, those can affect us quite heavily. And even some fragrances and chemicals that, you know, we have been programmed by our society to believe makes our home and our laundry smell super fresh can actually be causing a great deal of endocrine dysregulation and could probably be increasing our risk for hormonal cancers quite considerably. So think about that, what we breathe, you know, the lungs are a very permeable membrane and we're inhaling a lot of things through that and it's a great surface area, just like our gut. So the next is, of course, our gut. So ingested in the food that we eat is not just nutrients, but we can get heavy metals ingested through there. We can get chemicals that come in on plastics, which is why drinking out of plastic water bottles could be problematic and having food stored in plastic containers. And mold toxins also can get in through our food. I'm gonna talk a little bit about molds as well. And interestingly, most of the research done on molds is done in animal science because the way that our animals are raised nowadays is that they're fed a ton of grains in order to get them fat as quickly as possible to make as much money off of them as possible and getting them to market quickly, even though most of them eat, you know, grass or in the case of chickens, bugs and insects, not corn and soy. And they store these grains in these big silos that over time will then get some humidity and grow a certain amount of mold on them. So animals and ourselves actually are fed lots of foods that have a certain amount of mold in there, even though we might not see it. And the animals would have been developing joint problems, um, all kinds of neurological issues. And so a lot of research has been done in veterinary science as to how to ameliorate some of these effects of mold toxins on the animals because it does make them so sick. We also can ingest mold toxins through our food. And the, the foods that are most problematic, as you would imagine, are things that can be stored as grains and, and or things that can get moldy and then processed or ground up so that we don't notice that there's mold in there, like tomato sauce, which could be a problem, like peanut butter, which could be a problem, and coffee grains, if, if we get it already ground, could also be a, an interesting dilemma for us for molds. Interestingly though, we can absorb uh, much more uh, mold toxins, about 600 times more through our lungs than through our gut. But if, as Nancy spoke about, we have an increased leaky gut, that's gonna increase the chance that we will be absorbing more of that mold through our gut. So very important to have as healthy a gut as possible because that, that's how we get exposed to the outside world. We can also have toxins get absorbed through our skin. And this is happening all the time. I'm gonna talk a little bit about beauty care products, things that we, you know, uh, from our clothing, which now is often made out of recycled water bottles and now we're exercising in them, which I think is ironically hysterical <laughs> and, and absorbing some of those plastics through, through our, um, our synthetic materials as we sweat to get in better health uh, through the, laundry detergent that we're using that keeps residues on our clothing through lotions, through creams, through makeup, all of these things can are ways that we can get toxins absorbed into our body. Now, there's two other things that I wanna mention about toxins in our body that are not on this slide, but I think that they're important for us to know. And they really aren't ways that they get in, they're ways that they might be already in our system, but we might have an increased release of those toxins. And so that's why it's not on the slide, but I want to mention it to you. So many times, a lot of these toxins can be stored in fat tissue. And if we have been, you know, gaining fat over the years and storing toxins in that fat tissue, and then all of a sudden we wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm going to get in shape. And we have a very uh, quick weight loss or someone might undergo a lap band or a, a lap sleeve surgery and lose weight very, very quickly they can actually get a very large release of those toxins into their system simply because they're sort of melting their fat tissue away and those toxins are being released. So definitely something to think about if you're having increased weight loss. 
um, and losing that fat tissue. If you start to get symptoms, please do work with somebody to see if your toxin level is actually increasing at that time. And the other issue that can cause an increased release in toxins of toxins that are already stored in our body is osteoporosis. So this can happen in both men and women. A lot of heavy metals can sometimes get stored in our bone tissue. And then as we lose estrogen through the years and we start to release some of that uh, bone mass, some of that lead, especially lead, can leach into our systems and then cause more symptoms. So that's something also to, to be aware of. I think osteoporosis is problematic. Um, dairy intake is very problematic. And I would never recommend dairy intake as a solution to osteoporosis because it actually makes it worse because of the balance of calcium and phosphorus in cow dairy, which is very different from human dairy, if you wanna call it that. And so our system senses all that extra phosphate and says, oh, I have to release all this calcium. And it does that and then weakens our bones the more dairy we have. So that will uh, cause not just osteoporosis, but also a release of the lead that might be stored in your body, which you might have absorbed throughout your life. Okay, so how does the body handle toxins? You know. We could have a whole week's lecture on toxins, so I'm just going to just briefly go over some highlights. I can't get into it in you know, just 20 minutes, but I want you to get an understanding of how different things that you might hear might affect how your body handles toxins. And the first thing I want to mention is ApoE4 allele. Many of you are aware of what an ApoE4 allele is. It's basically a, a gene that handles a protein, and there are many different forms. There's ApoE4. 4, ApoE3, ApoE2, and if you have two copies of ApoE4, you tend to handle inflammation in a more aggressive way, and you tend to have a little bit more difficulty metabolizing cholesterol and handling lipids in the body. But what your allele for ApoE is, is also going to de determine how you handle toxins. So someone that has an ApoE4 allele or two alleles, so I'm a 3-4, for example, so I'm going to have a more vigorous inflammatory response to any insult in my environment that, that comes my way. And for toxins, this might actually be a good thing because be, you, since my body has an increased inflammatory response, then I might not have those toxins affect me as much. However, that's, that tends to be true for heavy metals. But when it comes to things like viruses, if you have an ApoE4 allele, you actually are more susceptible to having problems with viruses because the ApoE4 allele makes it easier for some of those toxins, those viruses and other pathogens to get into the brain and then you, you can't get them out. So it's interesting. It could be beneficial on the one hand. It could be detrimental on the other. And again, as Nancy said, some of these things are things that are out of our control. We are born this way, as Lady Gaga says, but we, we do the best that we can. And, and when we know that this is the case, we want to pay special attention to how to protect ourselves. The other thing that I want to mention that Howard touched upon, I don't think he used this term HLA subtypes, and I, I, don't, I don't want to get too technical, but HLA subtypes is what he was referring to on the body's ability to tag certain toxins and get them out of your system. And depending on your HLA subtypes, you might have uh, a genetic predisposition to having difficulty recognizing a particular toxin and putting that little label on it. So your liver, when it gets to the liver, it goes, I don't even know what this is, but I guess just throw it back into circulation because it doesn't have a tag on it, you know? And so then those toxins can accumulate in your system. And different HLA subtypes have different susceptibilities to becoming toxic with certain things. For example, microtoxins from molds or lime. You know, those are some that we, we know, we've seen the HLA subtypes. And when you have those, you're going to be more susceptible to having uh, problems with Lyme disease and mold toxins. And then, you know, as, as we all know, the, the way that we detox from these things, you know, our body has mechanisms to detox from toxins, but usually at a slow rate. Unfortunately, the amount of toxins that we have in our society nowadays is more than more than we're evolved to really handle. So we wanna make sure that the body's detox capacity is optimized and you have to have good levels of nutrients. You have to be methylating properly. And the more toxins you have, the bigger the load is, the more difficult it is for your body to process those. So that's just a, a, a little bit on how the body handles toxins. 
Um, before I go on to kinds of toxins, we've all talked about inflammation and inflammation is, I, I want everybody to understand that inflammation is a natural part of what happens in the body. It's part of how the body heals and inflammation, it, even, a, even an, a healthy meal is a small inflammatory event, but it's when we have too much inflammation and we have it go on for long periods of time that we can then get those free radicals, the little electrons that shave off of you know, uh, molecules. And then that causes oxidative stress, which literally damages, like it just oxidizes all of the other tissues. And that's how you get that, that damage. So I just want to mention that about inflammation. Inflammation itself is a natural process, but when it gets out of hand, then we get the collateral damage. That's what I want you to know about that. Okay, so kinds of toxins. So we, uh, we know that heavy metals can be problematic for our system. We have lots of minerals in our system. We're, we're made up of the stuff of the universe and, and the earth, right? All of the minerals are found in our body. However, if we have some of these heavy metals, they can be very problematic, like... Um, mercury, lead, uh, arsenic, cadmium, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, molds. So molds are naturally occurring organisms. There are tens of thousands of different kinds of molds, but some molds can be very problematic for our system and can affect us and be quite toxic, create lots of neurological damage, including uh, dementia. Chemicals in our environment, you know, in the last, probably about, probably since World War I, we have been creating a, an enormous amount of, of chemicals, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and, and there's millions of tons produced in our country alone that we use in our environment. And the more we use, the more gets in our water supply, the more that gets in our soil. And when we have these in our environment, we can't help but be exposed to them. So we really need to understand how to limit our exposure and where to look for those things so we're not making it more difficult for ourselves. As Nancy alluded to, there's so many uh, chemicals in our personal products. And I, I think this uh, survey is from many years ago, but I think one survey said that in the morning before a woman leaves the house, she's already put on 26 different uh, toxins in, in her personal products. So that could include anything from lotions to soaps, to shampoos, to toothpaste, to perfumes, to makeup, and the, the list just goes on and on. Pesticides. Pesticides are an increasing problem because of the way that we handle our agriculture, but also the way that we like to landscape. And for all of you who like to play golf, I just want you to be aware that golf courses are some of the most toxic places on the planet because of the amount of pesticides that are used in order to control the greens. And that can very easily soak right through your skin. Glyphosate uh, has been getting a lot of press recently and farmers that work with glyphosate often find that they get kidney failure pretty quickly. And that is because as it soaks into your skin, it has the ability to draw in all of these heavy metals from the environment right into your body, which then your kidney's trying to get rid of. And when it gets overloaded, it just damages the kidneys and they will shut down. So let's start off by talking about heavy metals. Um, mercury, mercury is often uh, associated with silver fillings and because there's mercury amalgam in there. And whenever you're having hot liquids or you're having friction across them, or there's two different kinds of metals in your mouth, which could create an electric current, you can get release of mercury vapors, which then can go right up into your brain. So that's problematic. Um, the fish is, oh, sorry. Fish is one of the biggest ways that people get mercury exposure. The organic mercury is, is the most problematic. So that's gonna be the kind that is gonna be ingested by fish. And, the bigger the fish is, the more it has ingested. And the reason why it's getting in fish is because it's a byproduct of uh, industrial processes. So we, it's released into the air as air pollution. It comes down from in rain and you know, in the air, it settles down in the water. It gets absorbed into the water and then gets into the fish 
it bioaccumulates, which means it, they, it continues to build up in their system. And then the bigger fish eat the smaller fish and then bigger fish eat the medium sized fish. And then you get larger and larger amounts of mercury as, that, um, as the cycle goes on. So any large fish, tuna, swordfish, grouper, these are very large fish when they're brought to market that tend to have much higher levels of mercury. And I wouldn't recommend those fish anyway because they don't have the good fats that we want from some of those other fish like the salmon, the mackerel, the anchovies, the sardines. Um, mercury can also be found to some extent in vegetable and food products. Uh, it's, it's, anything that I'm gonna talk about today is pretty ubiquitous in our environment. So you really need to look and see where your source is coming from if you, are, if you get tested and you have high levels of mercury. So lead. Lead used to be in our gasoline and we would breathe it in every time we would fill up a tank. I remember very fondly sitting in the back seat of the car when my dad would fill up the tank, the windows open and breathing in the fumes. Don't ask me why I ended up being a chemistry major. I'm into that stuff. But, um, but you know, it, we're soaking in lead and now gasoline is unleaded, which is great, but jet fuel is not. And so we're still soaking up a bunch of lead and um, the chances that it's coming in through, uh, through our food, through our water is still a possibility. And you should check and see if you have lead levels. As I said, once you get uh, older and you start to lose bone mass, the chance that you're gonna be releasing lead into your system is increased. So you should be aware of that. Cadmium. So cadmium has been shown to cause cancer and kidney damage. It's most commonly absorbed through cigarette smoke, either primary or secondary. However, cadmium can be also a byproduct of industrial processes and can get in the water supply and can get in the soil. And ironically, vegetables, those vegetables that we love so much that have lots of fiber in them, as they're growing, they suck up minerals in their fibers. Cadmium is one of them. Thallium is another one. I don't have that on my list here, but you should be aware that sometimes vegetables, even organic ones, depending on the soil that they're grown, can have heavy metals in them. So if you do get tested for metals and you find that you have a, a high level, you should work with your practitioner to start to figure out where is your exposure because eliminating the exposure is going to be the number one priority for you. And then arsenic is very common in our environment as well. It used to be, and I think it is still in some cases, added to chicken feed as a, as a way of decreasing the, the growth of, of molds in there, ironically. And uh, so chicken could be one source of arsenic. Arsenic can also be in the soil and therefore is absorbed in many foods. Apples can be high in arsenic. Rice can be high in arsenic. And so it's important to do a little research and see what varieties of those foods, if you eat those foods, might have less arsenic in them. Now, arsenic is not like some of the other heavy metals because it is eliminated from the body much more easily. Mercury, lead, and cadmium stay around for a long time and your body might need help getting them out. But arsenic can be filtered right through your kidneys. Um, it just takes you know, good functioning kidneys and to be well hydrated. So really the issue with arsenic is you don't wanna be having a, a large load all the time because that can hurt your kidneys. And then others to consider gadolinium, if you're getting a lot of MRIs with contrast, you know, really question uh, getting a lot of MRIs with contrast, especially if you're getting them in very short uh, order, like close together, because it's something that's very difficult for your body to eliminate over time. And tin and nickel are some other heavy metals that I've seen that have really affected people's um, neurological functioning. All right, molds. I'm going to go through this quickly. I know we don't have a whole lot of time. Molds is a very complicated topic. There are hundreds of thousands of molds in the world, and obviously when you walk outside, you're exposed to many of them. However, the ones that really cause damage for us are the ones that are found primarily in water-damaged buildings or water-damaged vehicles, and, but they also can be found in foods. So when you're outside, molds are growing in competition with other molds and with bacteria from the soil and there's it really creates a balance right but so there's there's a lot of competition there's not a whole lot of overgrowth of one type of mold or another however when you've got a building that's sealed off and you have some moisture in a, in a closed 
dark pocket. What happens is you get molds to start to grow unopposed from other um, uh, microbes in the environment. And those molds in particular, which grow on things like drywall and products that have cellulose wood, they can then be very toxic for our system. They can be growing inside of the walls, under the floors, in the ceilings, and we don't, we're not aware of it, but we may be breathing in those particles and the, the fumes that they release. Um, I, I wanna mention vehicles because as um, Lisa mentioned, I have a practice in South Florida, and in South Florida, there's a, a funny pattern of weather where you know a storm can just blow through in 20 minutes and then you know, be gone. And so sometimes people will run in and they'll leave their car windows just cracked a little bit because they're like, oh, it's going to be so hot. I'm just going to be in for a moment. And now they found that their car is just soaked on the inside. And so they never really get it dried out and they can actually get mold growing inside the car. Molds love plastic. So they love wood and cellulose and, and those products. But once they get in plastic, they never, you can never get them out of plastic. So if you have a mold, a moldy vehicle, a moldy rent-a-car, please get rid of it and get another one. I, I don't know how else to say it. I know people don't like to hear that, but <laughs> that's what I have to say. Now, mold can wreak havoc with your system in many different ways. Um, Howard already introduced the ideas of the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But I want you to understand that with mold, a dead mold particle is just as bad as a live mold particle. So a live mold particle can be problematic because it triggers your immune system and because it's releasing compounds all the time that are toxic. But even a dead mold particle, even if it's killed with something, those pieces are something that your immune system recognizes and it's going to mount an inflammatory response against. So I don't care if it's a live mold particle or a dead mold particle, it's going to affect you adversely and you should be aware of that. The next thing is that while molds are growing, they can be releasing these volatile organic compounds that can be carcinogenic and can be neurotoxic, like formaldehyde, like toluene. You know, these are things that we, we want to really avoid. Those are the things that give those people headaches. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, my apartment, it kind of smells kind of musty, or I go into this hotel room and it smelled musty. And then within an hour I had this headache and then I had brain fog and I couldn't think clearly. That's because you were breathing in all of these volatile organic compounds that are damaging your neurological functioning instantly. And then you have mycotoxins that are released. So these are different from the volatile organic compounds. These are toxins that molds release out into the atmosphere to inhibit the growth of other molds. So all of these molds are in competition with each other, but some of these are really damaging to our system. Okra toxins, gliotoxins, trichothecenes, you know, these are just like complicated names for all of these different mycotoxins, but those get in our system. We have trouble sometimes getting them out of our system and they can really cause a, a great deal of damage to, to our system. So uh, as Howard talked about, there's the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And molds are kind of like, huh, they're like a bad joke when it comes to how they affect our immune system. Because the innate immune system, which is the, the part that reacts immediately to stuff without thinking about it, right? Like histamine release, so you get itchy and red and swollen and mucus and all this stuff. That's your innate immune system trying to defend against anything that it thinks is a problem. Well, mold upregulates this part of your immune system, which means that you go out for a walk and there's a little bit of pollen, instead of getting like a two out of 10 response, you could get an eight out of 10 response. And then now you've got this chronic inflammation from a response that's way higher than it should be. And chronic inflammation we know is a problem, not inflammation that happens and then gets resolved, but chronic inflammation is really problematic. So the innate immune system is on hyperdrive, making you really uncomfortable, having a lot of symptoms and causing much more collateral damage. But the joke's on us because then our adaptive immune system actually gets down-regulated. So those, those immunoglobulins, that part of the immune system that's supposed to remember what to attack and then attack it, it's like 
the, half of them is out of commission. So that means if you've got a mold problem, you are gonna have more difficulty getting more infections and keeping the infections that you have already in your system, which a lot of us already have viruses, keeping those at bay. Mold make that whole process much more difficult. So uh, let's move on to chemicals, our environment. Again, there are literally textbooks with thousands of chemicals. I couldn't possibly cover them all, but I wanna cover just the categories as quickly as possible so you get an idea and start to think about how these might be in your home and, um, and how you might be exposed to them. So first of all are plastics. Pla plastics are ubiquitous. We use plastic for everything from drinking bottles to food containers, to liners, um, food storage products, shower curtains, water bottles, you name it, we've got it in plastic. And if it smells like plastic, it's a problem. It's leaching out chemicals, it's getting into our system, either breathing it in through our skin or ingesting it. Flame retardants. So right now it's probably impossible to buy a piece of furniture or home furnishing for your home that doesn't have flame retardants on it. So it's become law now to have flame retardants in order to thing, have things burn less quickly. However, household products are constantly like degrading and forming dust. And flame retardants have either uh, fluorides or bromides in them to make them flame retardant. And if you know the periodic table, right, fluor fluoride, bromide, um, chlorine, and iodine are all in the same um, place in the, in the periodic table. And all of those will, except for iodine, obviously bromine, fluorine, and chlorine, chloride will displace iodine in the system. And so then your system is not gonna act as it should. It's gonna be more neurotoxic and your thyroid is probably going to be affected considerably. Um, bromides, by the way, are also found in all of our bakery products because they're used as, as dough conditioners. So something to keep in mind if you're thinking about going gluten-free, definitely do it because you also don't need the bromide. BPAs and BPSs. So this is the stuff that's classically in your water bottles. It's also in baby um, pacifiers, baby toys, chew toys, things like that. They are classic hormone disruptors. They have estrogenic activities. They are what are also termed as obesogens, which means that they affect our metabolism and cause us to gain weight, even though we're doing everything that we should correctly. So really think about it. And even if they say BPA free, um, it could have BPS, which we uh, are know can be just as bad as BPA. Okay, POFAs and PFTEs. So when Nancy spoke about nonstick pans, I love that she said, you know, if it's in your kitchen, it's not a problem until you heat it up. <laughs> so if you want to have it as decoration, that's great. But as soon as you heat it up, it causes a problem. My favorite um, thing about nonstick pans is that the companies say, well, you know, you should always ventilate when you're using the pans in order not to breathe in the fumes. But they don't mention that those fumes just kind of stick those fluorine molecules right into your food and then you just eat it anyway. So um, yeah, you definitely don't wanna be breathing the fumes but you really don't wanna be eating any of the food cooked on those pans either because they are so, so dangerous to our system. All right, chemicals in our personal products. Again, more than I could ever cover in this small talk but I wanna just mention phthalates um, and some of these other chemicals. So. Uh, one of my pet peeves is direct-to-consumer marketing of drugs, but another pet peeve is this uh, marketing of all of these fragrances that we're being brainwashed to believe is the only way that things smell fresh. So Downy Unstoppables, Glade Plugins, Gain Detergent, you know, you can now get your Gain scent in your fabric softener too. That's so great, except it's not because phthalates, um, are shown to decrease neuroplasticity in your hippocampus, which is exactly where you lay down memories. And so it is a, a major cause of memory issues and contributors to dementia, as well as developments, you know, not just for de developing kids, but for us as, as we get older. Um, also interestingly, interesting is that phthalates decrease testosterone and they interfere with masculization. So you know, if you're, if you're concerned about your hormone levels, you do not want phthalates. Um, they're also found in perfumes, so just be aware of that. Parabens. Um, there's so many studies out there that say, no, but parabens really aren't that bad for you. 
but but they are. So I'm just going to say it like it is. They're uh, really heavily found in our um, cosmetics, especially. So if you put them right on your skin, they're in shampoos, they're in lotions, and they mimic estrogens and are directly neurotoxic. They also decrease mitochondrial functioning. So mitochondria, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, are the energy centers of the cells. They have a multi-step process by which they create energy, and they use lots of different cofactors and vitamins, but they're very susceptible to being poisoned. Lots of these chemicals and lots of like heavy metals and things that I'm talking about, all of these toxins can decrease or poison our mitochondria. When our mitochondria get poisoned, they can't create energy which means the entire cell suffers because all of the things that it needs to do to function properly, reproduce, duplicate its DNA, detoxify, create proteins, eliminate you know, uh, uh, damaged proteins, can't happen very efficiently if they don't have the energy to do it. So uh, parabens will directly decrease mitochondrial functioning. They cause an increase of inflammatory cytokines. Howard mentioned the cytokine storm that's happening with um, COVID-19, we know that people that have already higher baseline levels of inflammation have higher levels of cytokines already floating through their systems. They are more susceptible to the cytokine storm because they're already starting off at a, at a higher baseline. So things like uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, for those of you who are familiar with those terms, those are some very inflammatory cytokines that parabens tend to increase. Mal, we have to start to um, wrap okay. this section okay. up. Yeah, I think I just have one more slide. So I'll just okay. go through this really quick. Um, triclosan, which Nancy mentioned, uh, damages muscle, increases reactive oxygen species, decreases your ability to, to um, detox and is a neurotox agent. Um, formaldehyde, preservative that can causes cancer and damages your tissues. Heavy metals, as I already mentioned. Um, preservatives. So preservatives in your food and preservatives in your personal care products, anything that has benzene in it is going to be very problematic. So just read the labels very carefully. Do a little research um, because those can cause um, neurotoxicity. I'm not going to get into pesticides. I um, already talked about how we use them in landscaping, weed killers, and glyphosate I think I covered. And insecticides, please be aware that when you're spraying these things directly on your skin, you are absorbing them through your skin. And... Um, Thank God we no longer spray DDT into the air and breathe it in, but we are literally putting it right on our skin. Solvents and cleaning products are full of toxins. I mean, solvents, disinfectants, uh, Lysol, carcinogenic, fragrances I already mentioned, chlorinated products that help stuff get into our system and then we can't get them out. So try to use natural cleaning products, you know, going back to like vinegar, lime, um, OxyClean is fine. Uh, boric acid, those are really great things to use, and just soap and water without some of these very damaging chemicals. Um, other pathogens, which we can't get into right now, but I want you to be aware that viruses, some of the things that Howard mentioned with, the, with infections in the mouth, those can all get into your brain and cause collateral damage because of the inflammation of your body trying to handle those. So the more we can keep our infections at bay, the healthier our eating is, the better our nutrients, the better off we'll be. And then I really want to mention the, the toxin that no one talks about, except Nancy did mention it, my favorite, is alcohol. So alcohol, we all think it's fine, but it's a direct neurotoxin. It impairs your body's ability to detoxify. It depletes your dopamine, directly poisons your mitochondria. And so you're going to have lower cellular energy. The best way to address toxins is to avoid the exposure. If you have heavy metals or molds or chemicals, please work with a professional because in some cases you want to remove these from your body gently. You don't want to mobilize heavy metals or molds or toxins faster than your body can eliminate them because then you can get really acutely sick and that can precipitate symptoms for people. So I hope this has been a good introduction to toxins um, and, uh, and how to deal with them. And you can see how it all kinds of comes around and affects all of your metabolism in your brain. So thank you very much. Madeline, thank you. That was very comprehensive. Um, so we do have a few questions and I have a couple of other ones that have come up. Um, so I'm gonna go back and share, let's see. 
my screen. That's not, no, hold on. Well, that's fine. We can stay on here for now. Um, so there was a question um, <clears throat> for Nancy about what are the best pans to cook with? If you're not cooking, I mean, a lot of people love the convenience of nonstick. So if we're not using that, what's the next best thing? So if you like the convenience of nonstick, you can actually have your cast, you can create your own nonstick by getting a cast iron pan, which are not expensive. The companies are Lodge, and there's another one, Field something, I forgot, anyway, those, but, but th these pans are not expensive. And if you heat on a, on a, basically on a medium flame, heat the pan for maybe three, four minutes to, before you put any oil or cook on it, you can essentially create your own nonstick pan from a cast iron and you use a metal spatula. So you use a metal spatula, use it, a cast iron pan, you heat it up for on a, on a medium, maybe a little higher than medium flame, not crazy high, um, before you use it. So I like, I like Loge, um, not expensive. The pans are like in the 20s and the high 20 ranges, depending on how, si the, how big the size is. Um, I also like enameled cast iron. This is a little more expensive. So I like Le Creuset. Um, there is also Staub. Um, and there's some, there are some other ones out there that are very good. Um, stainless steel is fine. It doesn't, it doesn't work quite as well. Um, the nice thing also about cast iron is that you get a little bit of the nutrient of iron in your food. So those are, those are some of my top choices. Um, you know, but I do really recommend, and thank you, Madeline, for backing this up. Those, those, those past, cast iron, I mean, those um, uh, nonsticks really need to go in the garbage. Yeah. Good for us to all hear. Um, I confess, <clears throat> I, I still have one or two in my cupboard, so I need to get rid of those. <laughs> Lisa, can I add something? Sure. So now that we're home, and uh, for the last couple of weeks and cooking a lot and looking at all the cooking channels and books, one of the rules of cooking is you always heat the pan before, the, before you put the oil in. Right. And, 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 uh, and you don't use high heat. You use uh, low or medium heat, let the pan uh, heat up, then you add the oil and that creates its own nonstick surface. Yep. Like everything in our world, we become rushed and hurried. We want to cook things fast. We want to make things happen fast. Uh, if we would go back to the way our mothers and grandmothers didn't have uh, nonstick pans and they weren't scrubbing the pans all the time because they knew how to cook. So uh, you don't need nonstick pans. You can cook just as well and not have sticky pans. Better, even better. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Um, so I have a, a, a question here um, that Bonnie asked about, you know, what, what have we seen in the past five years that changing diet and eliminating pesticides is making a difference in people um, with the incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's? Um, so, I mean, I, I'm sure you could talk to that in my own experience and working with another doctor whose specialty is in toxins She's, she's been treating people with um, the glyphosate that um, Madeline had mentioned. It, it can be very hard at times to get that out of our system. So uh, what we're seeing, I think, are more incidences of toxicity coming from a lot of the, the sources that we, we just heard about. And they're not that easy to get out. So, um, you know, Dr. Bredesen, who's done a lot of the research on the reversal of cognitive decline, I mean, he has, and, and maybe Madeline, you want to talk to this, this particular type of Alzheimer's that's toxicity related. Um, some of these cases are very difficult. So, so we, have, we have seen that. And it's, um, that, that's one aspect that can be very challenging. And I think there's a lot of success in some of the other types of of Alzheimer's um, that that you know mild to moderate cognitive impairment that can be treated a little bit more readily. Yeah, I think the the issue with changing diet and eliminating pesticides is that it's glyphosate because of its use around the world is now basically ubiquitous. So even people that are on organic diets, 
strictly organic diets, they have glyphosate in their system. And it, it's, a, it's a molecule that, that starts to replace a glycine molecule, which is a little amino acid in your system. And once it replaces that, it's hard for your body to, to you know, recycle that and get it out. So one of the things is we, we want to look at what does the glyphosate do in your body. It interferes with metabolism of vitamin A. It carries in these heavy metals. It, it doesn't allow you to use the nutrients that you need properly, like zinc, uh, copper, things like that. So you, you have to find out what your levels are, find out where your metabolites are by doing some functional testing and then see where you need to replace those. And it, it really depends on your exposure. And someone might have a great diet. And then, you know, in Florida, we have all these, these homeowner associations that take, oh yeah, we take care of your landscaping. And people are walking their dogs through there and, you know, in their shorts and their flip-flops. And all the while they're absorbing all these pesticides right through their skin. And they don't realize that they could have a great diet and still be absorbing a ton of these pesticides through their skin. So that's why I wanted to make sure we understood all the different ways we can get in our system. But I do definitely believe that if you eliminate your load and you maximize your nutrition, as Nancy said. Your webinar said, is currently in off-air mode, and attendees will join in the waiting room. You are currently the only person in this conference. <gasps> okay. Thank <laughs> <laughs> um, so you. We all heard that. <laughs> Nancy, we, we had a question on... Um, monk sugar and er erythritol as a sugar substitute. Hmm. Mon monk fruit, I think, is the monk question. Monk fruit? I, can't, I mean, I, I'm looking for you to unhinge yourself from your sweet taste liking because it's not, it's, it's not helping you any. So when I hear stevia, which I'm not sure whether or not these things are related at all, but it, it trains the brain to think that something sweet is coming and the insulin rushes in and lowers your blood sugar and creates a sweet craving. So the more you have of these added sweeteners, no matter what they be, I think you're asking for some trouble. Now, when you're eating sweet fruit, it's not an issue because the fruit itself is a balanced package from nature where the fruit, the sugar in the fruit is distributed in the fiber and it's like a collagen matrix. It's distributed kind of evenly absorbed gracefully. When you're looking to just get a hit of something like that. Um, and again, I can't speak to those things specifically. Um, you know, I can speak about agave and this and that, you know, those things I don't know so well. I just know that any kind of added, added sugar, added sweetener to anything is, is, is better off not had versus having something that's naturally sweet, like a piece of fruit. So I'm not answering the question exactly, but hopefully I'm giving you something useful to think about. Right. Well, I would add the, the number one first rule in dealing with the coronavirus is social distancing. <clears throat> what we need to do is social distance ourselves from sugar. <laughs> and, and, from, uh, and knowing where all the toxins come from. Uh, interesting to note the number one occupation, highest cancer rate are groundskeepers on golf courses yeah. Be because, you know, and what people work all their lives, they save up money so they can buy a house right on a golf course oh, in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, that's not smart. And, and the uh, glyphosate, uh, a source you may not recognize is cattle that graze in grass that are sprayed with that toxin, their hooves absorb all that. And what do they use hooves for? Making vitamins. Those are the gelatin capsules that they make vitamins. So you may li be living a very healthy life and they may be taking vitamin capsules and taking toxins in with your vitamin uh, vitamins. Yeah. So we have to learn where the risk is and social distance ourselves from them. Thank can I, you. Can I piggyback off of something that Nancy said too, is that so erythritol is a sugar alcohol mm -hmm. and not everybody processes sugar alcohols the same way. Some people um, have a lot of difficulty digesting sugar alcohols, and in large amounts, they can affect the balance of your gut microbiome. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, I, and Nancy said the most important point, which is the more sweet foods we have, the more we acclimate ourselves to sweet foods, and the more difficult it is to back away from that. Um, monk fruit extract, again, is an extract. You're not having the whole fruit, so you're having a concentrated amount of sugar. In small quantities, 
yes, it's probably better than having a ton of sugar. But the problem is that if you if you want a ton of sugar, you're going to have a ton of you know sweeteners that don't put you in a good position. So. So what I, I, I didn't mean to do that. What I wanted to do was get down to the end of the uh, of the presentation to share with you the um, the email addresses of the panelists so that if you have other questions, you can um, you can email them directly. So here they are. Um, so hopefully that will, no, it went back to the beginning. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay. So, um, I'll, I will, I'll put that up in one second. And, um, I just wanted to let you all know before we end, and I know that somebody from Katona study group does want to close that, um, sharp again, naturally we have a, a website, sharpagain.org. Uh, that has lots more information. It's being actually revised right now. Uh, we do do presentations uh, virtually and also in person uh, in the greater New York area. And uh, we do have three new programs. Um, one is going into beta very shortly. It's, a, um, it's called a virtual support group and it includes information and Q&A with an expert uh, like a doctor or someone like Nancy, and also an opportunity for people to share. And that's gonna be limited to 12 people starting in early May. So if anyone is interested, you can email us at info at sharpagain.org. Um, and we're also gonna be starting one-on-one -on -one health coaching later this year. So, uh, we really want to help people take the kind of information you've heard tonight and put it into practice. And we know it's not easy to do. So that's our goal. Uh, education is great, and we've been doing that for many years. But we really feel that in order to make a difference and to really stop the incidence of dementia that we're seeing, even at earlier ages, that people really need some help to, to put this into practice. So feel free to contact us. And I just want to thank Katona Study Group again for having Sharp again. We, uh, we love presenting to your organization. It's a, a very broad-minded and, and like-minded in terms of the perspective. and. Um, we, you know, we will hopefully work together and collaborate more in the future. So thank you. So thank you so much for presenting. Uh, it was a really deep and rich uh, presentation and we really appreciate it. I noticed a couple, of, I don't know if you answered the question about, will the slides be available? Is this something that you're going to share or, um, or just the emails for questions? I think just the emails for questions. I mean, we hadn't talked about sharing slides. Um, if, if that changes, we'll let you know and you can make that available. Okay. So um, we can also post your email addresses on our website or we can email the email addresses one way or another. Um, and um, anybody else who has questions can uh, contact Sharp Again Naturally. And of course, Sharp Again Naturally is a nonprofit organization and they are 501c3 um, and they thrive on donations. So I wanna encourage everyone to make a donation if they can, uh, whatever is possible, even small donations are welcome. Um, so we are really appreciative of your time and energy that you all put into this presentation. And I, I really wanna thank you and I hope we hear from you again in future years for the Katona study group, online or offline. Hopefully another, not another five. We'll come back before then. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not so long. And um, thank you. Is there anything else that you want to say before we sign off? Uh, no, I mean, I, I really want to stress, I mean, Dr. Castellanos talked about it in terms of toxins, but it's the same thing for everything, which is prevention is, is the best treatment for memory loss and dementia. 
So it doesn't matter how old you are. It's now is the time to pay attention and to start, start taking steps to keep your mind fully intact as you live the rest of your life, hopefully well into old age. And I would add, it doesn't matter how young you are. You can start too. <laughs> right. <laughs> Super. Thank you so much. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And I'll be reaching out to you with a new email blast about the May presentation and the June presentation. So uh, don't give up on KSG just because we're all in our living in our little hobbit homes <laughs> isolated. Um, and, and Bonnie and I are trying to put together just a little social gathering online, of course, but um, kind of, um, you know, a happy hour with herbal tea. So um, <laughs> healthy <laughs> and healthy snacks. So um, we'll be trying to put that together over the next couple of weeks. So thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a good night. Stay Thanks safe. Too. And please reach out to KSG or Sharp Again Naturally if there's any way that we can help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.